All right, the next speaker is Phil Emma, who's chief scientist at IBM Yorktown, uh, IBM Research Yorktown. Yes. Yes. So Phil is one of those guys that Yale always told me, this guy knows everything about everything. If you had any question, you know, he knew the answer. So very interesting results from that question. No, no, no. Oh. Does Yale do what? No, no, no. I'm not sure. So I was told we should talk about the future of computer architecture, and I wanted to start just by saying that uh, the field has a 3,600-year history, starting with the Babylonian dynasty, as we can see, and going through to the final frontier. And I'll talk about how technology has moved going through that and why people are different. So question one is, why did God give man opposable thumbs? And I came up with a few things, one for Vulcans to say hi, and then you can hitch rides, you can uh, use it to ride the subway, or, or pick the guitar. But I don't think any of those are the reasons why man has thumbs and other creatures don't. One is for sports to hone our hunting skills. And if you look at, at uh, popular sports and why thumbs are essential, just think soccer and basketball. So in most sports, in fact, we generally don't use them and we don't use them in hunting. So I, I wanna get to what are our thumbs really for? And this is technology related. They're, they're for texting, obviously. <laughs> and <clears throat> this was a, a dramatic, mere 40 year evolution. And I remember when Star Trek came out in the uh, late 60s, that people saw them talking on these things and, and people thought, you know, this is way, way out there. And then 40 years later, hey, we have them, but we're not talking, we're typing with our thumbs, right? So, so I think what we didn't foresee is how quickly the technology evolved, but what, but what we missed, and we always, always get this wrong, is how people tend to use the technology. And one more comment, uh, because men had thumbs and monkeys, that's why we have the binary number system. So I'm showing how we count with thumbs, and unfortunately, because we only have two hands, two thumbs is many. So w we know there were early cultures where there was one, two, and many. And, and I have, you know, even apes learned to, to use thumbs to count in binary. And that's why the first several computers were, were binary engines that used the binary number system, because early man did computers. So I wanna show, here, here are three things that had new, completely new ideas that got pushed forward because of these engines. Interestingly, the three electronic ones were all largely funded because there, there was a big war going on. And I think that happens today a lot too. The difference is now we have this big mobile consumer space that's driving a lot of growth. But when, when computing was new as a technology, it was because governments needed a way to calculate things a lot better. 
So the philosophical breakthroughs I wanted to outline was Babbage showed you could do automatic calculation by machine without thinking, because the machine doesn't think. Turing came up with this elaborate theory of computation, which now is commonplace, and we all think about what's the complexity of computation. Eckert and Mockley took calculation to a, an extremely large scale at its, at its time, it, but it was generating mostly firing tables, so there was very little conditionality in that. It's, it's number crunching like a huge filter. And I think what von Neumann brought to the table was the idea of a program modifying itself when it runs. So what the program does depends on what the data is. And, and that was a significant philosophical breakthrough. And what I keep hearing from people now is doom and gloom because Moore's law is uh, coming to an end and then that's the end of computing. And I agree with, I forget who else said this, but I think quite on the contrary, the way I tend to view this is because CMOS just kept, you know, technology kept scaling, that we could keep building the same old thing, and yeah, we, we put twists and swizzles in it, I'll say that, but I don't think we fundamentally changed what computing is, and because Moore's Law is becoming, you know, I'll say dead-ended only because it's getting prohibitively expensive to, to continue it, this is when we're gonna see some real innovation in architecture. And I won't beat this to death, but I, I just wanna say the, the history of electronic computing, and roughly speaking, I've, I've separated this into programming applications, architecture, and microarchitecture. And I primarily think of the lower two quadrants as my milieu. So I want to say what we've not evolved there. And I can do this by, by personally going through some of my own patents, both, uh, and, and some of this relates to Yale. So this was uh, early 80s. I did dynamic dynamic translation. And the, the way I came up with that idea was, as a pretty new researcher, I was looking through code that happens over, in a, you know, commercial code, and this is uh, assembly level. And I kept seeing, see, I said, let me see what pairs of instructions, what triples of instructions, what, and I kept saying, seeing the same sequences over and over. So what became obvious to me is those sequences, in fact, were macro expanded. Somebody wrote something in a high level language. Somewhere along the line, the compiler said, aha, that function, it translates into these instructions. The problem is when you have a commercially successful machine, you can't just stick a new uh, instruction of the, into the ISA, so the, these compilers would put these standard scripts in. And the idea was, hey, I don't have to change the ISA. I can, when I am designing a new machine, create new instructions, recognize sequences as, as implementing those instructions, and dynamically sub substituting into this into the code. Why I thought this was interesting is it was new and I, it took like 18 years to file a patent on it because they, they kept saying it wasn't new because isn't this the same as two at a time? And isn't this, you know, so, so when you deal with lawyers, they never understand what the invention is. And this, this they never wanted to file. They said it's, it's two at a time. And then this is one that I got an award for actually and since Yale Pat was pushing the bounds of superscalar, IBM at the time, with one of the early power machines, was going to do an eight-at-a-time machine, which I thought was a waste of area and power, so I was against it. 
and Yale was doing 16 at the time, so as a joke, I made up this invention to just show up how absurd branch prediction would be because to, to do like 12 or 16 instructions, I'd have to predict three branches a cycle, do three independent eye fetches a cycle. In our commercial code, we have a branch about every four instructions. I couldn't fit four at a time on, onto the page, so I, I did three at a time, and I thought everyone would laugh, and so, but no, they gave me an award. So this is, <laughs> so this is uh, one of the sub engines is I put in a, a, a taken branch, and it guesses a sequence of three subsequent branches, which it feeds into those tables. And note that the first, second, or third could be incorrect. So actually, I need three of these engines, each starting at a different starting point. And then there are late selects in there. And this allows you to, to get past mispredictions and things like that. But nobody left. They gave me an award. I just, you know, life is strange. Uh, so now I want to talk about the real future. And I think there are three dimensions in future computer architecture. The obvious one is environmental. So you make things like temperature and power and energy and cost of operation. You make those visible to the program that's running. You may, you may even put them into the microarchitecture. Second, I think we have to move beyond scalar operands. And I think this is a big one. Because since von Neumann, all computers, what they do is they deal with single operands, and most of the weight in a program is all this jumbling of indices and registers and all, so that I can superimpose a, a complicated data structure on a one-dimensional memory going from zero to n. And then I think there are abstract kinds of computing we can do that don't involve calculating anything. So quickly, I, I'm redefining the von Neumann bottleneck and throwing 3D into the mix. That uh, conventionally, I have a read, and I have an L1, and I have an L2, and now an L3, and an L4. You know, we're, we're getting more and more and more. And, and part of it is because the bandwidth between those levels tapers way down. So if, if I do reference something in the L3, I'm not going to get it for a long time. If I reference something in memory, it's hundreds of thousands of cycles, frankly. And the, so the reason our operating systems and software is so complicated is when I take a page fault and that job is dead for 100,000 cycles, uh, to use the hardware, I, I juggle 100 jobs at the same time. And, and that makes the operating system that has to control all of this and monitor all this extraordinarily complex. Because I, I show, oh, we go out to DDR memory cards and come in on bit serial channels and, and junk like that. So I think one of the opportunities that, that something like 3D gives us <coughs> is you can eliminate a lot. If I have monstrous bandwidth between everything, I can eliminate all these funny levels. And if I can put you know, a petabyte or something like that up here, I probably don't have to wait more than 20 or 30 cycles when I have a, a page fault. And I can move the whole page. And that says, I don't have to juggle 100 strings. Maybe I have to juggle five strings. And I think that dramatically simplifies the so, so this is hardware simplifying the software. Another thing, we, we deal in scalar operands. We could do oper multi-dimensional operands that are themselves data structures. So here I'm showing simple matrix vector arithmetic. And the program, rather than having row and column indexes for A and B and all of that and burning up a lot of registers, I'm saying that at the hardware level, I should be able to have a C row column is A row times B column. Because if I'm doing this in three dimensions, 
I, I can align data in a way that it moves straight down. So today when we have a cache and there's a double word bus, the thing over here has no notion of how stuff over here is stored. If it's 3D, I can fetch a row, I can fetch a column, and this allows me easily to, do, to have a compound operation done at the machine level. And I think that's several orders of magnitude speed up and a lot fewer misses because we're stupid about caches. One of these strides misses on any, every reference. Another thing is we have files, like if I have an employee record or a, a, a credit card record, it might be many megabytes worth of stuff. And a lot of the searches I do, I don't want many megabytes. I want like the person's name and their phone number and their limit, maybe. So I'm going to look at three things. And because of the way the, the, the record is structured, I just do tons of branching. And every data reference is a cache miss. And there's almost no computation in it. So I think we could create cache structures that, that dynamically take the program and redefine a cache block as having an abstracted structure based on the high-level data structure. And, and therefore, if I can cache these records, I can get staggeringly greater performance than I do today, because th today this is memory bound. And, and in three dimensions, if I have a three-dimensional cube of bits, rather than doing two-dimensional Fourier transforms, which uh, beat up everything because of the non-locality of data, I can put three-dimensional objects in storage and manipulate them directly as if they were physical. And, and A, I can take what's now a supercomputer, put this into a handheld device th to do crude things, and B, I can put this in front of a supercomputer to dramatically cut down the, uh, the amount of computation it needs to do if, if for example, this weren't good enough. And in a very recent study, what I did was I took uh, existing core on, I, an existing chip, P7, and said, instead of sticking memory on, which doesn't buy that much, why don't we stick two of them together? And the observation here is in the high end, we don't run linearly in power. We burn a lot of power to hit that speed. And if I cut the power in half, I only cut the speed by 25%. So the idea is if I had a mode where I could turn one of these layers off, run the other one at full power, or run both layers at three quarter speed and look at the throughput, I actually get throughputs greater than a factor of, like I thought, oh, you'll get 150%. We got throughputs greater than a factor of two just because of cache behavior. And by the way, since the caches are directly on top of each other, I can double up these L3s, make them twice as big without changing their access time, because the access time of storage is, is proportional to the square root of its area. So in 2D, if I double the area, I've increased the access time by square root of two. In 3D, I don't do that at all. So, th so there's no penalty. And then I want to close by saying, well, what is architecture? And students should know this. Architecture creates an interface between applications of the day and the technology of the day. So you need a classical understanding of what those applications are. You need a contemporary grasp of the technology. The problem with success in this business, like IBM and Intel, is those are the ISAs were defined many decades ago, technology has moved way forward, but you still have to be compatible. So a lot of the stuff you do is just, you're doing it in an ancient instruction set when you could do it much better, but I've got to run these binaries. And both the applications and the technology evolve and they both drive each other. For example, if I put all this stuff in my pocket, uh, I'm going to do searches and things like that that today I probably can't even conceive of. To do architecture, you need a broad technical knowledge and you need a lively imagination. I think of it as being artistic. 
And then these are, this is my closing foil for academia on what kinds of research we should do. Uh, that if I do, great, this Lewis Kahn was a building architect. I don't know why building people call that architecture. But it says, <laughs> to, to do a great building, you start with the immeasurable, go through measurable means. So that's where the undergraduate scholarship comes in. And then, you, then in the end, you've got to go back to something that's not measured. So after you've built it, when someone says, well, what, what kind of spec does it run? It quite misses the point. Architecture has little to do with problem solving, although we frequently look at it that way. Rather, it creates desirable conditions and opportunities that we didn't think was possible before. And in terms of popularity, I say if you want to get rich from writing, then write the thing that's read by persons who move their lips when reading. I mean, that's, that's where the volume is. And finally, if you're in academia doing research, uh, you want a partner that's kind and understanding. And if, and if they have millions of dollars, thank you very much.